say nice things about me and I'm Yeah, All right, go ahead. <laughs> Right. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, we're back uh, with another round of um, Ask Rabbi Tovia, and uh, this is a short series. Um, well, it's a short program in a series where you can ask Rabbi Singer some questions. What you need to do though is give us those questions, so you can um, comment under this video, uh, or you can send me a PM on Facebook. Uh, but make sure I see it. Don't just leave something on Facebook that's like hidden as a reply to somebody. PM it to me or leave it under this video and I will um, curate those questions. Um, before I introduce Rabbi Singer, I encourage you all to go to outreachjudaism.org. It's an awesome site. I can tell you that like four years ago I was listening to the MP3s from this site and we're still listening to the MP3s from this site. Um, and you can also buy... Rabbi Singer's uh, awesome two-volume um, book set of um, Let's Get Biblical, which is fabulous. If you've got questions, uh, the chances are that some of those answers are going to be laid out really clearly and concisely in that book. Uh, and I encourage you to go over and get that now. I use it all the time. It's literally within hand's reach whenever I'm at the computer. Um, so we're going to welcome back Rabbi Singer. Thanks for giving us your time. I know you're um, completely overworked. Um, but really appreciate you spending time with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jason. I uh, feel like we were just yesterday in the land of Israel. Uh, send your wife my best regards. And, um, and we had a blast. I mean, being in the Holy Land was really a very, very amazing experience, yeah. especially with you. It was like a dream. It was. It's, it was very much like a dream. When I came back, it's like the bubble had popped and that, peace has, has gone. And now I'm still just remembering. I'm still trying to filter everything that happened. It was awesome. Oh, so um, that brings me around to, uh, if you're interested in going to uh, Israel next year on the Tanakh tour, then go over to uh, truthtoyou.org and uh, you can sign up for the Tanakh tour 2016. Put your um, name down now. We are, where are we? The 30th of November is the recording day to day and the bus is already a quarter filled. So one in every four seats is gone. Um, so go over and um, secure your place now. You won't regret it. It's life-changing. Awesome. So uh, today we are looking at quite a long series of um, related questions that was given in by Rita Janeau, a friend on Facebook. Oh yeah, so uh, go to Facebook and like us on Facebook. Uh, find us on Facebook and get involved on Facebook. Facebook has a huge um, community of people um, who all study together and uh, we get on and we learn together and it's really great. Um, Rabbi Singer is one of the uh, many awesome rabbis, possibly most the awesomest rabbi that we have in the collection, but he's there as well. Um, so you can get some real um, good uh, study time um, on a site where most people are just showing pictures of what they had for dinner. Um, but I really encourage you to go over there. Anyway, so Rita gave this long question. I'm going to read it out now and then we're going to break it down. Why is the rebuilding of the temple so important? What is the purpose of giving such precise instructions? Why is the Temple Institute working so hard to create the temple now? How should someone interpret the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37 sequence? Is it a vision of actual resurrection from the dead or a symbolic resurrection of the house of Israel from destruction and exile or both? Um, I know it's a huge, obviously, you know, this, we can't do this for four hours. Um, and I know it's a huge series of um, questions. But I think the, what, what I'm interested in first, if we can go there first, is um, the Temple Institute. Is the Temple Institute trying to rebuild the temple or are they trying to make sure that when the time comes to rebuild the temple, they're ready to go? Well, I, I, I know some of the founders of the Temple Institute very well. Uh, some of them are very dear friends of mine. Uh, uh, I could tell you what they really have in mind, uh, and that is to prepare the generation for the Messianic Age. They replicate many of the of the kalim, the vessels that are used in the Beis HaMikdash, in the temple, according to Jewish law. And when I say replicate, I, I, I mean that they actually build the vessels and the garments for the priests and so on. 
according to Jewish law, that they would they they would be kosher, and they have some really brilliant um, scholars working. I mean, some of the finest scholars in the world working there. Then certainly, it is their hope that perhaps the Messiah would use these instruments, their the the kalim, the vessels that they make in the temple. I I am sure the that they are not thinking God needs our help in producing vessels because, you know, or else what's the Messiah going to do without our vessels? Uh, there is no doubt that the thinking is, that as the Gemara says, we are commanded to, there is a mandate, see peace only Yeshua. In fact, that's one of the questions a person will be asked after they, after they're 120 and stand before God, did you, the, the typical translation is, did you anticipate the coming of the redemption? But Sipisa is a language, is a Lushan of like a, a shepherd, a person who's a watch person, a watchman. Were you watching for the signs of, of the redemption? So it's certainly their interest in heightening the awareness that we please God are living in the Messianic age, for people to prepare themselves for this moment uh, in every way, spiritually, physically, to give people a sense of what these instruments look like so that they are in, a, in the proper mindset for the final redemption so that the promises made in Scripture as they unfold, that people will understand the kind of world we're living in. Now, you might say to yourself, well, people have been for 2,000 years thinking, that it's going to happen then, it's going to happen now, it's going to happen then. It didn't, so why should now be different? Well, the answer is, in every way, we are living in a very different time. In that we, are, we, are, we have observed Jacob's trouble, which means we have endured Jeremiah 30, verse 7, uh, where you have a tribulation, but we've had many. How do you know the one we had is unique? And that is that we're told from this final tribulation, ye Voshea, the redemption will come. And no question that the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, was born out of the ashes of the Holocaust. And we are, the Jerusalem was liberated in a, in, with miracles. And therefore, they are, the Temple Institute is committed to advancing knowledge and awareness and spirituality. And I'm sure that they hope that that um, that uh, that that the the public's interest and knowledge of of the base hamikdash of the temple that is promised in scripture, all of the scripture, including Ezekiel thirty seven, uh, in fact the whole end of the book of Ezekiel, that itself will bring about the coming of the Messiah, whose coming is interdependent on the return of the Jewish people, Isaiah fifty nine verse twenty. I, I, we went, um, actually we didn't have a look around inside the Temple Institute, but we kind of had a little look around the Temple Institute while we were there. Um, and I, I, what, what struck me was that it was a great outreach for people who really didn't understand. I'm sure there are a lot of people that visit Israel and don't really understand, um, what the Temple was for, or what it looked like, or what the, uh, um, the purpose was, you know, that especially when they come from different faiths. And um, one thing I found that the Temple Institute did very well was it was a really great kind of outreach um, to educate people about what the purpose was, what the Temple Mount should look like and could look like and will look like. I enjoyed that area of it very much. It's easy to understand when you look at Isaiah 2, very famous passages that describe the Temple and how all nations will come to the Beis HaMikdash, um, you find the same uh, same ideas convey throughout Scripture. It's the closing passage of the entire book of Zechariah. Bear in mind that what is unique about the Messianic Temple, uh, in in distinction to the first and the second temple, it's it, the the same basic principles. It, it will be grander, larger, no doubt. But what is very unique about it, and this is clearly expressed in Scripture. Because the Bible tells us repeatedly that the Messianic age will eclipse, and the events that will unfold 
will eclipse of the exodus from Egypt, which is really hard to imagine. I struggled with that, with that, with that uh, promise of Jeremiah and Isaiah for many years. How is that possible? What could possibly eclipse the exodus? And but what is clear is it's that whereas in um, Abraham redeemed 70 souls in Haran, uh, uh, Moses redeemed a single nation in Egypt, um, the, the Messianic age, uh, led by the Mashiach from the house of David, will bring about the redemption of the world. It's, and in fact, that's how it is described. If you look at the last two passages of Ezekiel chapter 37, the, the scripture clearly tells us that I will build my sanctuary among you, and then all the nations will know that I am God. So the building of the temple, and talking about the future temple, is interconnected directly by the prophet to the worldwide knowledge of God. And that's the most central feature of the Messianic age. That the whole world will know about the one God of Israel. God will be king of the whole world. Zechariah 14 ends with the nation, the kings of nations, coming to the temple to bring their sacrifices and offerings in the future temple. So it's very, very important, but it's unique in that it's a worldwide center of the worship of God. And is that, to get back to Rita's original question, is that the, the main purpose of the temple? I mean, we know that God's everywhere. God doesn't need a box or a house. Is this, is this um, does the temple allow that us to have a focal point? Rob, it's not, you know, God doesn't need a focal point. Is it for, if, is it for mankind? Is that what it's for? It's a, it's a difficult concept, you know? Why does God need uh, a front door? Right, so the point is actually it is for the, the divine part of man that, we, that a temple was ordained and a tabernacle. And I think, um, I think a little bit of, of explanation is essential. And it's intriguing that she uses uh, this language, but in fact, because in, when King Solomon had built the first temple, in Jerusalem, those are his very words in First Kings chapter eight. I believe it's verse twenty-seven, where he says, "You know, this whole world can't contain God. How could this house contain you?" It's very cl clear that God isn't like, um, like I need a place to stay. So, so we have to make sense of why would why would we be given? Why would mankind, the Jewish people, be given a mandate? to build a, a Mishkan, we, we went to Shiloh together, and eventually a permanent temple. Uh, in the past, they were, they were permanent structures, tragically destroyed. The final temple will stand forever and ever, as described in the end of Ezekiel. The question is, why? why? Why do we need a temple? Is it like a, a central place to come, where there's like the most, you know, e e exotic, uh, spiritual feeling. So, in reality, we have to take a step back. It's really a little bit deeper than that. Why, why were we given a commandment to build a, a temple? So, when we think we are uh, an entro ethnocentric uh, creature, we, we sort of, when we think about the beginning of time, we think about the beginning of our time. We think about when were human beings like us first created, Adam? Uh, when was the universe started created? Well, in some six-day modular period before then, God created the universe, and that's when everything started. So what's, that is because we're thinking in our terms. Nothing mattered before the universe was created. But in fact, that's a very, it's a very serious mistake. This is a very deep issue that Rita is really asking about. As it turns out, God not only has no end, but he also has no beginning. That's very important. He is ain't so. He had, he's eternal. He has, there's no, he is what, what we would call the, the first cause. And God was doing very well without the universe. Didn't need it. And he built the Almighty, created the universe based on um, based on scientific, uh, very well fine tuned principles, laws of mathematics and physics that have nothing to do with God. God doesn't need the laws of, of thermodynamics. He doesn't need 
the convection that moves clouds over land so that rain falls not over the sea where it where it collected but over land it, none of the things in this world have anything to do with god god is shel chenad isaiah 57 verse 15 he stands outside of eternity he's so why then did god create the the, the world for mankind to create a creature that is both Ad Adam, earth, and and in the Selim Elokim, which means in the image of God, and we would have free will. That was the purpose of it all. And then we, so he created this house for us based on principles that had nothing to do with him, not that he needed, but we needed in order to survive, in order to survive. And it's who was given the mandate to build a temple, only those who are B'Tselem Elohim. Those are the ones who are, who are given that commandment. So, why? Because we are created in the image of God. So, just as God created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh, we are commanded to build the tabernacle, the temple, but we are told in the, in the we, we, did it, we went through the entire Torah together on the truth to you, uh, we, are, we are commanded never to build a temple on the Shabbat. Just as God rested on the Shabbat, and he didn't build our home, so when we build God's home on earth, we don't build it on the Shabbat. And in fact, all the laws of Shabbat, the 39 principles of what is forbidden on Shabbat, are intimately tied to the what... Uh, what people had to do, the very functions that went on in the temple. That's why they're connected. So therefore, what, what are we doing in a temple? We are building a house for God. Just as He built a house for us, we are building a house uh, for God. And why are we doing this? Because we are created B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. And we see that, in fact, in the very two people who were given the mandate, and the Spirit of Hashem was upon them to build the tabernacle. One, is, one his name was B'Tzalel, which really means in, in the image of God, and the other is Ohel Yav, which means the house of God. So the one who is created in the image of God creates a house for God. This gets down to the details. This now follows perfectly into the the, the, these, this enormous amount of detail of precision of how the temple is to be built. Not only is there precision how the temple is to be built, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. I mean, it's beautiful, it's certainly grand, but there are so many laws uh, that are connected to the temple. Laws of purity and impurity. If you come into contact with something unclean, and you're in a state of ritual impurity, and you can take 500 showers, and it wouldn't make a difference. And there are all kinds of laws going on in the temple that have nothing to do with our physical world. So what we are doing is, we are told in the Bible, in Scripture, Kedoshim to you, Ki Kedosh Ani Hashem Alikecho, Be Thou Holy. Why? Because you're creating the image of God. Because I, the Lord, am holy. So what we are doing is something brilliant. We are called upon to do what God did, and that is to build a house for him, a universe for him, based on laws that we don't need, which make no sense to us, which we can't, what, what is it touching something unclean have to do with being unclean and coming under the same? So therefore, we are given uh, uh, copious details from uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, really 41 through 47, the most detailed messianic prophecies in all of Scripture. There are many, but these are the most detailed, the most ecstatic. I mean, Ezekiel is just a, just an ex it's just a, a, a book, a holy book of enormous colors and detail that we find nowhere else in the Bible. I think that's why Ezekiel is, is called a uh, son of man so often he's you know because you almost think the man was divine i mean he's he, he's called son of man right away as soon as he sees the divine chariot he sees something just absolutely spectacular so just make sure he's a son of man he's a mortal he is not 
don't think that he's divine in any way. Because one might conclude that if you think about the amount of spirit that was upon him and what he was able to encounter in his prophetic career. So what we're doing when we build a temple is we are building a house for God and doing we are we are doing something that is God-like. We're doing exactly what God did. God built a home for us based on principles that he doesn't need in turn, but he rested on the Sabbath. We are building a home for God based on spiritual principles that have no that do not relate to our physical being in any way but certainly spiritually relate to and that's why the temple is very central but what is unique about the messianic temple that sets it apart is that uh, the temple is a place for all nations that will come and and pray and all nations as zephaniah tells us will speak in a pure speech. And all nations will come to the house of the Lord. For out of Zion will, will come forth the Torah. And that's Kimitzion Tetu Torah, Dvar Hashem Yerushalayim, the very famous prophecy in Isaiah, in the second chapter of the book of Isaiah. So that's why, the, that's what's going on in the temple. We are acting as Selim Kim, which means the image of God, and therefore we are literally doing what God did for us. Awesome. All right, that's brilliant. You know what, I think I'm going to break up the question because um, Ezekiel 37, I think, deserves its own um, video for the people that search that. So if you're watching this, just clip over to the next video and um, you'll be able to get the next question on Ezekiel 37. And then if you're not interested in that, then bye-bye and we'll see you again soon. <laughs> if this wasn't such a big hit, then we'll be all right. <laughs> so that's